I'm going to start with um, something that uh, I made for a show in Berlin this past January, and it appeared on a screen this small. Uh, so it's a little loop that's on a, a little DVD player pinned to the wall, and it's quite small, and it's a small part of the exhibition, but uh, I'll actually begin with it. Which was an, uh, 
an agricultural flat of um, a plant with very small, tiny green leaves. It's called in English, in England, mind your own business, which I find really interesting. Uh, but so the, there was a B a B52 bomber shadow in the middle of this box of babies, <coughs> and I wanted to return to this notion of the shadow of some giant technological power from above uh, for this uh, work. Okay, uh, this was one of the works. This is just an, uh, an image piece, and it's based on something real, which is, uh, it's called the active denial system or the pain ray. It fires um, microwaves so that it boils the water uh, 164th below your skin so that you have to run away. And yes, it's real and yes, it's in use, but it's only useful for crowd control at this point, though they're trying to think of how to put it in a predator drone so that it will go over people. And <laughs>
um, <laughs> for both the sandbox and the construction. Two colors of sand. We stole them from that construction, but I don't know what it was. Um, sorry. <laughs> you? Yeah. It was in Berlin. They're rebuilding the plots, but it's, it's like construction. Of the building houses. They're building, they can't be building houses. So the, 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 the folks want to plot some. It can't be a house, right? That, the folks who are in the theater is right here. And this is a portable toilet and so on for, for whatever it is they're building. And they're rebuilding the street pipes, and this is somebody's sculpture, I think. And I think there was also in the space itself, there was this kind of construction yeah. worker, um, that's what I think you yeah. meant. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of a, a red and white event in the space, oh, in the gallery space. Oh, that's that's, mm -hmm. right. that's, that's my, that's part of the, the, uh, the, uh, yeah, there, here. Oh, that's, that's the demarcation of the minefield. Right. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Same ones outside the window. Because <laughs> that was visible from the side. We were like, yeah, this is this is so you know that this is actually an installation. Thank you. 
When I made this work, nobody remembered anything about Chile. Pinochet had not been rearrested, had not been arrested, 
because of the judge, the Spanish judge, Baltasar Garzón, in England, and so it had sort of passed from memory, but the United States has special responsibility for the coup in Chile, since we so actively engaged in supporting the coup plotters and also blockading uh, Chile. I made the work around when I was doing a series of roadworks, and um, I was especially interested in this NAFTA business because um, NAFTA stands for the North American Free Trade Association. It's Canada, Mexico, and the U.S. But Chile, as you surely know, is at the very bottom of the bottom of South America. And we were going to basically, through what you might call neo-materialism, incorporate Chile into the North American Free Trade Alliance. And at that time, if you went to the website of the government of Chile, it was the president of Chile at the time standing there with a, the welcome was a speech about joining this NAFTA, which actually didn't happen. They're now doing CAFTA, which is Central America. But um, that and um, the, I've always been interested in the way music is used to represent various forms of uh, cultural <coughs> globalization and so on. So, and the way in Chile in particular, popular song uh, and new song were used in, under the Allende government to try and have a countering uh, practice that wasn't just American pop music um, or high culture music. So uh, I just felt, and also the, the Odeona, the national police was uh, the force that was used for domestic terrorism under um, Pinochet. So when I came across the the police band, the, their their Odeon or police, their band, uh, I uh, playing John Williams. I couldn't resist putting it together with this amazing uh, Coke hand uh, giant billboard thrusting up out of the earth uh, uh, that I saw <coughs> down on the way to the airport, and this little boy at the airport who wandered up to the Coke sign and treated it as a haptic experience or, you know, a kind of a magical icon. Um, so, and the pan players, we know, it, okay, so the, it, in the Central Square, Plaza de Almas, there was the Sunday afternoon concert with a lot of tourists around and the police van, and then just around the corner in the closed shopping area were the <coughs> local uh, kids and uh, the guy playing the, the pan pipes. And then even further along was a blind singer singing in a dialect that I've been told uh, or with an accent that's barely penetrable about not knowing what I've lost. And there's a little conceit there where the camera doesn't quite focus on him. He's blind and the camera keeps going in and out of focus. And then the, the memorial in the cemetery, which is, by the way, way out of town, but it's still part of Santiago. Santiago is a big town. So. Um, I don't know if you have any comments about it, but I had to put the text at the end because nobody knew anything about Chile, as I said, so I had to explain at least some of them. the particulars. Um, but what audience did you address then? Because you say nobody knows anything about Chile, but we know about Chile. Of course, I mean, we again know about Chile. But what, what audience do you well, address? Well, I'm an American, so my work is primarily for my home audience. Yeah. So that's the need to layer it on black thickly. Well, I believe in layering on thickly anyway because I'm largely a burlesque. A lot of my things are, you know, like the leg, the big prosthetic leg, mm -hmm. and uh, these sort of noises that you walk through. I, I, I tend to want to move away from any motive presentation toward one that is distance but not cool. So, of course I needed to give the information thickly, but the work is always meant to kind of raise your hackles and to prevent you from just having an aesthetic experience. I consider myself a Brechtian, whatever interpretation you want to put on that, but I would like the text to be separate from the presentation, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. So, that's, that's what I do. I had the idea that I didn't need the text because it diminishes the poetics of 
of the, of the work. Well, the poetics of the work is for you to decide on yourself, but I certainly needed to explain, at least to Americans, why Chile mattered. And why, what does that mean, accompanied by the police band? What's the difference, you know, like, what? And believe me, in 97, it wasn't until 98 that Pinochet fell under the arm of the law. And so, and he was already out of office, so. And we don't do international news in the US, you know, it's just, you know, who cares? Okay, thank you. May I ask you another question? Please. Um, you are both artists and activists. And being an activist, I can imagine you would really like to reach a real large public. But as an artist, you know you have a very limited public. So why do you use art as an activist? Or I didn't say I did. <laughs> <laughs> Let me show you a couple of things. Uh, well, I'll, I'll preface it a little bit differently. Uh, I'll say that when it became clear in the summer of 2002 that the United States was going to do it again, uh, I was the founding member of a group called Artists Against the War, and I have a few JPEGs of some of the work that we've done as a group that might interest you because they're both directed at the art world but also at a larger public. So if, if uh, uh, I, I don't think, I don't think that art is activism. I don't think that art Obviously, propaganda is a form of art, and I wouldn't mind doing propaganda, but the problem is that once you produce something with markers as art, the formal elements of it become the primary issue of attention for at least the art public. And art that addresses war is not judged on whether it can send people to the streets. But I think that art, in conjunction with an already existing mass movement, can help potentiate people's desire to engage in real-world political activity. I don't know how to say that um, differently, but that's my effort. Um, well, this is the this is one of the mass things that we did. Uh, these are in no particular order, so you'll have to just bear with me. This was um, one of the many marches. This is probably the No RNC, the big New York City activist stuff the year ago, and before the election that was once again stolen, this time in Ohio. Uh, uh, again, there were once again about a million people marching for eight days with all kinds of action. I have to. Um, somewhat boastfully say that I also, as a private individual, I joined, uh, I became a legal observer, um, which is a, an instant an organization set up by the National Lawyers Guild, but then I became a video witness, which is part of that wonderful international program called Video Witness or Eyewitness Video, where people with their own little video cameras uh, produce videos on the ground of, of various shall we say, atrocities or events, and these are used as testimony, and I was a video witness, and the reason I'm mentioning it is that I, I witnessed, uh, I happened to be deployed to where the police were engaged in rather a vicious action against demonstrators that include, actually the Dutch group Philippines. Um, uh, I know because there was a journalist who was arrested, and the Dutch crew was asking me, why is this journalist arrested, and so on. So I remember, I said, well, where are you from? But um, my video witness material was used to exonerate the first two arrests that came up for trial, where the police claimed that these people had been doing this or that, and that they had been told to disperse. And my, uh, my footage proved that the police blocked the street and prevented anyone from leaving. And, so I think a little bit about that. But this is our matter. We have people say no to the Bush agenda, which, of which we produced 25,000, and which have appeared everywhere and in many places around the world as well, and was the official banner of the United for Peace and Justice, which sponsored the march. Um, so that was one of our mass activities. Let's see. This is the banner itself hanging from someone's window in Italy. Um, 
this was one of the uh, PDF designs of it before we actually introduced it. Um, this is us. This is posters that we did, they're hard to see, um, so I won't say it. It's, it's two different posters. One includes the Bush agenda. Um, this is one of the marches. This is something we're doing right now. It's uh, called the Swarming Images. It's been shown in Italy and various other places, lots of places in the US. It's a three-channel video it's multimedia installation. Um, and uh, we give it to people who want it on to our website. Um, oh, there are missing images here. What's a shame. Um, I'm sorry, but I guess we just didn't have time to get it into the presentation. So, uh, you probably didn't realize you were part of this. The earliest thing that we did was before the invasion of Iraq, and I have to say, I didn't take part because I was actually looking at Stockholm, was in December of 2003, or 2002, January of 2003, people went to the Mesopotamian galleries in the Metropolitan Museum of Art and did a draw-in where they were drawing uh, images and talking to museum uh, visitors uh, about the endangering of these historic artifacts in Iraq. And this was also done in Pittsburgh and Toronto, I believe, and it was actually covered rather well by the press. Then they were, I'm gonna find one, but I'm not gonna look. Uh, there was a stroll in with many people walking uh, down Fifth Avenue with strollers, with posters against the war, all saying, you know, the artists against the war posters. Uh, and uh, I think it was called Stroll, and we shredded the Bill of Rights uh, in uh, Grand Central Station. We had a big table and stood on it with all kinds of stuff, and we handed out shredded Bill, bill of Rights to passers-by in Grand Central Terminal. And I'm sure I'm forgetting some of the other things we've done. But um, we do consistently um, agitate against the war in a public space, not always associated with the art world. And, you know, those banners really were everywhere, and I still see them flying from people's fire escapes and so on. Um, and of course, as individuals, we take part. And as a group, we had a Leon Gallo banner. So it, huge thing that we marched, that the head of the march with um, in honor of Leon and against the war. Uh, so one, one does hope that uh, one can have some further uh, effort that reaches beyond the art world. Um,
just want to point to the fact that there's a picture of the meal and massacre lying on the bed, which is not so apparent. That is bad, bad burning the home model. That's the model. photo of a woman holding a photo of Muqtada al-Sadr, who is the, um, one of the militia leaders, a very important uh, cleric, because he's the son of a very important cleric in Iraq. Well, this is most, but not all, of the recent suite of montages. Um, I don't think that we managed to skip the old montage line here yet. That's George and Jeb. Um, I don't see him anyway. Um, well, let's see. It's a spring montage. Well, you can sort of see some of the old because 
my website's done by my son, and he's as busy as I am, and I can't ever get to say, okay, now we're going to make them bigger. Yeah. I, I seem to have noticed, for example, in the past years that uh, even the fashion world would use war imagery as decoration. Uh, so That's even that would be found, in war images would even be found glamorous. Really? Well, yeah. that How did you, uh, well, um, I don't think How did you think known. of it when making, of, did you think of it when making these works and that they would uh, also could also appear glamorous? Well, yes, anything in color is going to appear glamorous. Um, but what's the famous British photographer, the fashion photographer from World War II? Really famous. Uh, he took photographs during or soon after the Battle of Britain with models posed against this is really amazingly well-known guy. Um, uh, so people have been seeing, uh, there's something about fashion that demands destruction. And I'm really serious about that. So it comes very natural to the fashion world to want to see death and destruction and have some uh, alluring item in front of it. Um, in the 70s, it still was considered a moronic job to be a model, and models were thought of as having no brains. But then the supermodel was invented, and young girls wanted to be models. And the idea of model consciousness and the runaway walk has become part of you know teen culture and everyday life. And it seemed absurd to leave it out. So. Um, uh, what, yeah. uh, wouldn't you think the denunciation of uh, war would be lost in such a uh, combination of fashion and uh, that the uh, well, action part of showing uh, war pictures? Would I mean that uh, actually not to anybody with an adult sensibility uh, and not to anybody who isn't so callous that they could find it amusing to see prisoners of war and victims of war as opposed to backdrops. So I can't, I am not interested in shaking my finger at people and say you must think this. Though I wouldn't mind sort of being a giant um, puppet hovering over him going, war, you know, we've got to stop it. But I don't want to tell people what to do. And I have even very hortatory texts and videos that I repeat so that the second time around you say, hey, it's just a text. Um, not because I want people to not take it seriously, but because what I'm really interested in is trying to get people to think and to motivate themselves. So I don't want to control for readings. It's not possible. I think that there is no human utterance that isn't ambiguous, and to pretend otherwise is to engage in some flame of wishfulness or fantasy, which doesn't mean I don't try to say, look, um, if you think that this is a neutral presentation or image, that's your problem, not mine. If you think it's cool and glossy, I'm sorry. Uh, you're misreading me, but I can't stop you. Um, I do think it's hard to see these as something cool, but mm. it's what I mean anything is, can be yeah. cool. We already made to accept these combinations as cool and glossy because we? we get them in the uh, in, in, in the glossy magazines sometimes. Well, they wouldn't be so raw, and you wouldn't have the, they are usually ba background and very yeah, very right. eroticized, a very yeah. sort of glossy one. These are much more in your face. Yeah. Well, yeah, they have a harshness that would, uh, yeah, maybe question is style. So, Martha, you could imagine also the, the figures of men in the fashion magazines instead of only women. But there are also fashion magazines for men and also there are male models. Mm -hmm. And can you imagine that too? Like you made that version? Like, Photo montage with not only female models but also male models. There was one actually. There was um, one that only had men, and it had one was a 
soldier with a leg. One was a, uh, a men's magazine with a guy looking. Not a male model. I mean, he is a male model, but it's not maybe what you're thinking of. And of course, this is not the kind of thing you're going to see in a fashion magazine. It's just not. Or this, of course. This was for the Beaux Arts magazine in Paris. They do artist recipes um, a couple of years ago, and um, with photos. And I did patriotic Jello. So it was. A, I I've done a lot of work about food, and lately I've been taking a lot of recipes off the internet and using them for various things, including performance I did in Brussels in 2000. Um, that was called Romance. Uh, meal. And I took a lot of recipes for cooking with Coca-Cola, primarily. Uh, but this is patriotic jello, and it comes from a recipe on the internet of making patriotic jello, which is red, white, and blue in America, uh, in layers. And um, they're just embedded. <laughs> This was uh, Rosenberg's work, uh, a man and a woman who were accused in the 1950s, uh, this is, uh, yeah, in the 1950s of uh, being engaged in espionage with the Soviets during World War II, the Soviets were U.S. allies, by the way, and uh, of having given them the secret of the atomic bomb, and there was a long trial, they were not charged for treason, because it wasn't treason, and they, and they couldn't be tried for espionage because there wasn't enough evidence, so they tried them for conspiracy to commit espionage, and after several years, they were executed. Uh, the only civilians that were executed in peacetime for what's considered a war crime on the <coughs> Long, complicated story. Uh, so uh, in the late 80s, I was asked to um, be part of a show about the Rosenbergs. And I have to say that the trial uh, was kind of the horror of my childhood. It was sort of in the back of my mind. It's the kind of thing you never wanted to think about or talk about. But I wound up doing the work mostly about Ethel Rosenberg. Who they, it, it came out in documents later. They decided to. Uh, give her the death penalty in the hope that Julius would confess, um, which didn't happen. And she wrote, they wrote a lot of letters to each other in jail, and she was quite adamant about um, not, not succumbing. But this is a life-size photo of Ethel surrounded by images of uh, from the Life magazine and, uh, at, the, at the time that had many things in it uh, relating to the whole climate of fear and terror uh, and political repression of the U.S. in the 50s. Um, uh, the judge was in collusion with the lawyers and, and the government and the FBI. Um, but most particularly, I chose Ethel uh, because it has become clear that any time a woman steps out in the public and has a political presence, she is treated as a monster. And it was said about her that she was the ringleader and he was her henpeck worm, and, which is a common narrative, it turns out. So um, I chose her, especially because she was presented when, when Julius was arrested and Ethel wasn't. She was interviewed for a magazine. And here she is in her Lower East Side family kitchen, the perfect house frown and house dress, and wiping a dish and so on. <coughs> And um, this is part of it, and it's a towel that says, 
On June 16, 1953, President Eisenhower wrote to his son, John, serving in Korea to address myself to the Rosenberg case for a minute. I must say that it goes against the grain to avoid interfering in the case where a woman is to receive capital punishment. Over against this, however, must be placed one or two facts that have greater significance. The first of these is that in this instance, it is a woman who is the strong and recalcitrant character. The man is the weak one. She has obviously been the leader in everything they did in the spy ring. They knew at this time, as documents show, that she had no part in the spy ring at all. Um, the second thing is that if there would be any commuting of the woman's sentence without demands, then from here on the Soviets would simply recruit their spies from among women. Um, so, anyway, this be the only Rosenberg images. We told you a lot of them, but anyway. Uh, okay. Um, sorry. some close-ups. The jello has to do with the fact, jello, of course, is as you just saw, jello is the American national dish, which is a bland, tasteless baby food with stuff stuck in it, like marshmallows or canned pineapple. I hope you're not big, it's what, blanc mange, I guess, is that what it is? I know you guys have it, but I doubt it's your national dish. <laughs> um, <laughs> It's uh, like at every church social, you'll have all these things, ambrosia, which is uh, jello with walnuts and marshmallow and pineapple and all kinds of stuff. It's just, even as a child, I really hated jello. But um, that jello was the only, was the, the testimony of the guy in the spy ring said, Julius went to his closet and he took out a box of jello and he was watering the top of the house. And, when the two of them met, that's how we knew uh, that we were the right people. And so this jello appeared here and also on the towel rack, which is copied from the photo. The jello featured in this trial, which is considered the trial, it was called the trial of the century, the crime of the century. And there's a drawing of the two pieces of jello being fitted together that, uh, by the right ear that was uh, in Life magazine. But she was also considered a very bad mother because she was leaving her two sons behind. She was a very bad mother for being executed. <laughs> okay. Um, are you getting bored? Do you want to stop, see something else, see video? Could you? What? Could you elaborate a bit on your library project? Oh, my library project. There's actually a couple of pictures in here. That's what's going to be uh, opening, and I know Brent is here, at the Academy show in Antwerp. I saw it. It came up. <laughs> so the library is not actually my project. It's I mean, it is my project, but, uh, and that's my son. Um, uh, it's an EFLUX uh, organized project, and it is about 7,500 books from my library that uh, Anton Madoble said to me one day, why don't we just take your books and put them in the gallery? The gallery is a small storefront. Um, a half the size of this room, uh, not less. And they built shelves and brought in just several rows of shelves. And we just brought the books in. And um, I, why did I agree to do this? <laughs> um, because um, aside from the fact that they were completely filling up my house and all the going down the steps of the house and so on. I have been very troubled by the superficiality of art these days in the way that people are stepping back from the notion that art has content and that there is actually a community of discourse that's more than formalist, superficial, fashion-oriented, trendy, cool, or quirky. And uh, I would like to 
uh, say to people, you know, there's a conversation among artists, and we are part of the world community, and there are all kinds of possibilities for thinking that might interest you, and here is somebody's collection of books, and it's just a random artist's collection of books, and they are on many subjects, and um, there, we're in the process of cataloging the one or two thousand that remain the other side. Um, and I don't know what else to say about it. Did anyone want, want to ask or say something about the idea of showing the library? It's not, it's not about the books, it's about what's in the books. And there have been a couple of projects associated with it. Paul Chan decided that we should be um, organizing people. He has a, a project where people are reading uh, texts uh, which get put into MP3 format and they're available online. Uh, he actually did a text of mine called On um, Obsolescence from October um, Magazine before he said, why don't you just have people read from your library? So we're hoping to organize that in Antwerp. And, and there have been reading groups and study groups, and uh, I, I think that uh, uh, someone with a residency, just Silverman at the Frankfurt Kunstlein, organized screenings of the Dart and other movies in relationship to the library, and um, the students from the Stadel also organized screenings and so on. So it becomes a space and an opportunity for people to deal with questions that are beyond visual or beyond the, the work of art toward larger questions that interest, that, that have always interested artists, but don't necessarily, are not necessarily in the discussions about art as they reach the public. I don't know what else to say about it, sure. Um, individual libraries are often considered as uh, personal Por portraits. portraits. I know what an mm. obvious idea. Yeah, it's terrifying. <laughs> I thought you would say that. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's just is it a catalog? Well, revolvers. I was actually shocked that they're doing a book. We flux. I should have realized. Of course, they're going to do a book. Yes, so revolver is going to do a book. But we are still cataloging. So. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> Maybe. Do you have a system of your own, or a thematic? I have a thematic system, but of course it's gotten completely messed up. Well, also because I have a home, an office, and a second home, and so things have gotten jumbled that way, but of course there's also a lot of books still in those places, and um, then there are a few books I held back, and then one wonders, and they say, but look, she doesn't have this, or why does she have that? And, you know, oh my God. But um, there are books that I sold back because I needed them for research, and also, in writing things now, I have nothing but Wikipedia and Google. I don't have a library, and it's really quite distressing. Um, but it is, so this is permanent then? I doubt it, but <laughs> I'm afraid someone's going to set fire to the library or steal all the books. You see, I have different thoughts about it than I do about artworks. I never have those thoughts about artworks, but <laughs> I'm just so mortified at this whole thing that it put a spotlight on me instead of the books, and I have to worry about them now, like, oh my god. Um, Strange places have requested them also, which I won't say where, but very strange places they, where people don't even speak English. But this is a good thing, right? Because the idea that you would want to bring books into your gallery and have that, I mean, museum, and have that be what's available to the public as an exhibition, I really find that quite heartening. It's not that we say, read books, don't do art, but rather to, as I said, to bring again into the center. Well, I have to say something. One of the reasons I said yes was the following. What's happening in the States and where I teach is that 
graduate schools of education are trying to turn themselves into success machines, which means a complete estual and ending of all critical studies because everything is focused on the studio visit and studio practice and how to get your students into a gallery before they graduate and ideas, reading stops people from producing. So, the, there's actually an active effort on the part of administrators and some faculty, particularly painters, to prevent their students from having access to ideas in their institutions. And it's an amazing thing to me, I never would have imagined it, but, you know, not only are people nailing the coffin on the notion of theory, they are returning to a Kantian paradigm in which the faculty of appreciation of art is an aesthetic faculty that's separate from the rational and the appetitive. And though they forget about that part, uh, appetitive is okay, but rational is not. And you have very prominent artists uh, who are well advanced in their careers saying, well, there's nothing to be said about my work. You must simply experience it, which really is a little shocking to me, I have to say. But it also, I think, it, if you remember what one of the spurs to the aestheticist movement at the turn of the 20th century was, it was a hyper reaction to the politics of that era. It was a way for the art world to insulate itself from, you know, it's a let us do nothing moment, you know. Uh, we don't have to worry about that because, in fact, our problem is to uh, address the faculty of taste. Though taste is not the word in fashion now, I forget what it is, but it is still, it is a content uh, So, um, it turns me into a dinosaur, but in that I'm still interested in thinking, um, however difficult that is, but I do think that there's another way in which many, many, many young artists feel oppressed by the idea that they're not supposed to be getting together, having study groups, talking, reading, thinking, whatever, and are very interested in getting beyond that. And of course, there's all kinds of young artists who have joined into collectives uh, to also even, because it goes with the genius model. You know, I don't have to think. I'm a great artist. And it's, you know, um, usually I'm in. I'm in. <laughs> we know it's connected to organs that don't need to be named. Um, <laughs> so, uh, hmm. Which This is the garage sale, uh, garage sales from, um, this is in um, Moderna Mosaic in Stockholm. Um, this is the least typical one, uh, and I'll get back to that in a minute. Okay, so this is the garage sale of, my, garage sale of 1973 in an art gallery. Uh, Seventy-seven in a San Francisco the garage of an art gallery. <laughs> the performance artist Barbara Smith with a shark. And this is, what, and this is the new museum from two thousand and five. It was in the basement during my retrospective. This is the London garage sale at the ICA. Uh, June of 2005, and this is back to Moderna, which I'll say something about in a second. Um, the Moderna was a little different in that um, it, I was invited to have a little show of Moderna during the Rupedecker Art Weeks um, thing, and uh, I, the Moderna had a mold problem, and so their fancy, um, Sebastian Maneo building, I guess, um, had to be abruptly closed and the museum was moved off uh, their flex home and 
Island 2, which is a kind of a lovely suburban type or upscale up neighborhood. There's even a, I noticed there was a, a soap opera named Hutzelman on TV uh, in Stockholm when I was living here in 03, but uh, it was moved to uh, the, an old postal sorting building next door to the terminal, the main terminal, and I said, Oh, gee, you must have a really interesting milieu here with transit, which is one of my things. I do a lot of work about trains, planes, and underground. Um, and drugs. And they're going, huh? What? Oh, uh, drugs? Oh, yeah. Now, the drugs were all around. You couldn't avoid seeing it. But it was kind of this polite society thing where you don't see it. Like, oh, are there are drug people standing around in the corner and selling drugs and checking themselves. And it was really over. Um, and so I said, well, this building is really interesting, but who else is in it? And um, they said, well, there's this group that works with the homeless. Now, I've actually done a lot of work about housing and homelessness, and I said, well, maybe I'd like to work with that group. So we went and visited them, and on the way back, we went through the building on a catwalk over a go-karting facility. And I said, oh my God, forget the homeless. I want to work with the go-karting facility. But I quite mean it. But what I did do was I have a fee. It turns out they're stacked one on top of the other with the go-karting facility, which was the largest indoor go-karting facility in Western Europe, and was used as a management tool to, for Team Spirit. This was totally new to me. I thought it was like a ride in a Dodge in the car at a fair where the kids get in the car and they bang you. No, if you collide with someone, you're out. But so you bring your workforce and they put on a whole suit and a helmet and they get in the cars and then they feel really motivated as a team. <laughs> so I had a, a video feed. This is from the museum itself. They all look out the same window. This is City Hall. These are, so this is kind of a feedback loop. This is the homeless group's office. They're called Convictus and they work with homeless and HIV positive people in Stockholm and in Tallinn, Estonia. Um, and this is the go-kart, which was called Grace Town, and each of them had, uh, each of them contributed in some way to the exhibition, and in the center of the exhibition, we had a garage sale with items donated by the museum, so there were donations from each of the participants. Uh, for the benefit of Convictus, which had a registered number. So, and I don't know how uh, transparent Swedish is to you, but you can see um, it pretty clearly it says homeless and HIV positive. Um, and what they do is they have face to face relations with people, and that's their client base. And they also, um, so they have a little hut to meet people in the exhibition. And this is a, somebody who bought some books. Let's see if I can get yeah, this. Was, so. Okay, enough of that. Um, Part of the tape on torture that's not. Actually, I'll do something. Um, we've also, we've, it's called Domination in the Everyday. And it is a little bit about the way, I don't think I'll show the whole thing, but it is. One of the things that I was doing in the 70s was trying to make video that wasn't anything like television. And it used a number of things that are now actually not so unusual, which is uh, asking you to look at a crawl across the bottom of the screen. Now this is totally normal. Uh, at the same time as um, uh, listening to things, but do it. I, I presented you with too many things and asked you at every minute to deal with your own, to, to um, 
choose what you were paying attention to. So, escape. I can't escape. Who do you want? Come here. Can you tell me from here? No. And I want to show you everything. But what are you going to show me? Come here.
like to stay and talk, I'd be really very pleased to have a conversation with you. Um, obviously, I won't, I will just say that I also did a work called A Simple Case for Torture, or How to Sleep at Night in 1983. And uh, some people in the film school at Cal Arts have proposed that their students spend a semester uh, uh, working on a new version since the United States has now publicly embraced the notion of torture, which our president two days ago has said, but we don't torture. We just do these things which we don't do anymore, but we do other things. <laughs> we can't do them on our own soil, so don't even ask. Um, so, uh, I won't, of course, the thing about torture is never been torture, since I don't believe in, you know, torturing my audience other than with images and sound, but not, you know, with images where, yeah. So, maybe if the lights were on or something,